Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask a Leopard Owner takes us to Fort Lauderdale, Florida on the Leopard 45 sailing catamaran. Before introducing Jonathan, I wanna take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being a Leopard 45 owner myself, I get to work with Leopard, members of the Leopard community helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity, and exploration on their Leopard. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being re-recorded and will be published on leopard.com, leopardcatamarans.com in the coming days. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video once it's published. To submit your questions at any point today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. And lastly, there's a two question survey that will pop up after we wrap up today. We'd love your feedback so we can learn what you liked and things we can do better in future editions. Let's take a look at what we're going to cover. First, we'll learn about Jonathan, why he chose not just the Leopard 45, but also a Leopard 40. We'll talk about his crossings of the Atlantic, not once, twice, but three times. He'll share experience traveling the Mediterranean, and we'll talk about some lessons learned along the way. So Jonathan, thanks so much for, for joining us. And, Welcome to Ask a Leopard. Hey, good afternoon, Chris, and thank you. Thank you to um, all the Leopard team and everybody who put this together. And thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. And most of all, thank you to all of those who are tuning in from wherever you are. Without you tuning in, they wouldn't have invited me. So thank you for that. Um, the journey sailing around the world, that's, uh, that's basically where it all started. And, I had this dream, obviously, um, to try and change my life and go and do something a little different. Started with a Leopard 40 and then uh, graduated to a Leopard 45. Did three Atlantic crossings all in the last four years. Learned a huge amount along the way and look forward to sharing a little bit over the next uh, hour or so. Next slide. <clears throat> So I get asked a lot, why, do I why did I choose a leopard and what, the, what were the reasons why I did or didn't? And like, like every a prospective cruiser who didn't know how to sail and didn't know very much at all, I did my research, I watched the YouTube videos, I did all the, um, all the research I could before actually taking the plunge. And the leopard just came out on top in all the things that were important for me, the reputation, the um, bulletproof that it does cross oceans that most of them were for many years delivered on their bottom from South Africa. The, to those of you that don't know, leopards are made in, in South Africa in Cape Town. And they are they were for many years delivered over their bottom, so on their bottom. So that was immediately ocean going a, a boat. Their front door that have all the modern leopards have, which have a front cockpit and a seating area, which allows you to basically enjoy a better airflow in the boat when you're at anchor or in, in a, on a mooring ball, which as much as we love to cruise, as much as we love to sail, that's most of the time we're anchored or crew, uh, in, on a mooring ball somewhere. And being comfortable in the boat was a, a, a major factor. And last but definitely not least, the way the um, sails and the lines and the sheets and everything is set up, it all runs back to the helm and it's very easy to single hand. So with a, a crew of two, normally a, a couple type of people that go out on this type of thing, like I did, then you have the control. One person can control the boat very easily, and that makes um, all the difference in the world. So I chose the first one and obviously liked it enough to choose the second one. Next. <clears throat> So in the I started sailing in, in basically learned to sail in 2016. Did the ASA courses. We'll touch on that a little bit in the in the further on in the presentation. But my goal was and still is to sail around the world. Fortunately, it's been um, disrupted a little bit with COVID. Obviously, in the last year and a half, has sort of put a damper on things. But in the, since getting on the boat full time in 2017, I've done. 30,000 nautical miles in, with two boats, the first one being the 40 and being three years on the 40 and then the last year and, and change on the 45. Managed to go to the Med, do the three crossings, learned a huge amount along the way. You can uh, move on to the next one, Chris. Uh, did a, learned a lot of things along the way, 
there's the um, lessons that you get, and then there's the actual sailing where you actually learn the real, uh, real things. Why did we upgrade to the 45? Well, we as humans have this tendency and desire to accumulate stuff. I got on a boat in order to get rid of stuff and found myself two years later with too much stuff again. You start cruising and then you get kayaks and you get paddle boards and you get bicycles and you get extra sails and more fenders and more tools and then children come to visit and friends come to visit and all of a sudden we found that one of our cabins had turned into a storage room. So um, we decided to upgrade to the 45. I decided that, that after doing a lot of market research, only this time much more um, intelligent market research with experience and knowledge and two um, one and a half Atlantic crossings under my belt, I decided to um, stick with the best and what I know and what I like the best and we upgraded to the 45. 45 is a bigger, wider, um, better boat suited for what we want to do, for what I want to do to go around and circumnavigate. The 40 is an excellent boat, and funnily enough, I'm actually here at the Leopard headquarters in Fort Lauderdale doing some work on my 45, and my 40 showed up yesterday for the, for the people who bought it, and there was a pang of nostalgia going to visit my 40 that I'd done two ocean crossings with. Chris? You know, Jonathan, uh, you've had you know, a lot of experience on both the, the 40 and 45 from a space standpoint. The question came in, what are your thoughts of you know, a family of four when it comes to people and space on a Leopard 40? Is that accommodating or should they look at a different type of Well, and this will be my the theme for 90% of the questions that you ask me. It depends what you want to do because you have to match your boat to what you want to do. The answer is yes, absolutely. You get the um, what they call the charter version, which has four cabins as opposed to the owner version, which only has three. And as long as you teach everybody that they have to respect the communal space and keep their stuff in their own cabins and stuff like that, it's not a problem. We've seen, I've seen families of four and families of five that have been on 40s and smaller boats and, and stuff like that, and they all manage. It's absolutely doable with no problem. It's just a matter of everybody understanding that your space is limited and how to live. The, the first part of getting on a boat is learning how to live on a boat. You're not on land, you don't have a power plant connected to your power source, and you don't have a, an endless reservoir of water connected to your fresh water, and you don't have endless rooms and space, and you can't tell the kids don't play outside. So it's just changing the living a little bit and understanding the limitations of space, but yes, it should be no problem at all. Excellent, thank you. Next slide. So before I started, I can officially say I did not know anything about sailing. I'd been on boats many, many times. I'd been on sailboats, I'd been on catamarans, but never as somebody who actually has to do anything other than pull here, push there, which really doesn't mean much. And I decided since I wanted to circumnavigate, and that's the goal, I went to um, ASA, which is the American Sailing Association. I did their four basic certifications, which is a, a, a one week on the boat after you've learned all the theory. And that was, an excellent foundation which set me up to actually go and learn. It's like going to driving school when you were a kid, you learn to drive with the instructor and then after you get your license, you actually learn to drive. It's the same thing, go out, get on the water, make mistakes, break stuff, be caught out with the wrong sails at the wrong time, do things stupidly, don't be afraid to try. It's fiberglass, you can fix it, it's not a big deal. We broke, we scratched, we rubbed until we learned and today, in I can read things, I can do things 10 times better than I could ever imagine, but you have to go out and try. And that's basically the, the key to everything else. It's mileage, time on the water, practicing and doing. Next. Additional question here on the 45 compared to the 40. When you think about uh, kind of the ride in the open ocean, can you talk a little bit just on how the boat length affects the, the comfort? Yes, so that is that is also a big um, a big difference. The 40 is shorter and narrower, so with a higher, comparatively speaking, structure, it's a little bit more skittish on the water. The 45, obviously, being longer and wider, is a little bit more, uh, let's say, low slung, and it handles the big water better. Not that we had a problem with the 40, because we obviously did two uh, ocean crossings with it and, and spent three years on it, doing 20, 25,000 miles on it, 23,000 miles on it. Um, the ride is more comfortable than the 45. If you're planning to go out in the open ocean and far, 
the 45 would be a better choice, which is also um, one of the reasons we upgraded. And, and we, you can feel it when you're out in the open ocean, the waves are bigger um, they are spaced further apart. And you got to remember boats float at the end of the day, they're designed to float. So if you let it do what it needs to do and keep it pointed in the right direction, it will ride the waves even when they're 30 and, and feet and higher. But the 45 will ride them better. It's just a bit more of a smoother ride, less skittish and easier to, to enjoy. Over the years, um, in the last, basically since October 17, when I got on the boat for um, as a permanent liveaboard or permanent cruiser, depending on the definition, I've been lucky enough to be in three continents, travel to 18 countries. Um, it took a while to get used to the idea of doing things. The first crossing I did was the North Atlantic crossing, which um, is, considered to be the hardest of the three, and it, and it is, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But essentially, um, I've had the privilege and the, I've been lucky enough to travel to 18 different countries, each one unique in their own way, each one special, and the experience of doing it on your own boat, on your own time, with your own timetable, is something that cannot be compared to any other type of vacation. Next, Chris. So, as I mentioned multiple times already, I've crossed the Atlantic three times. The first time was, you can go on to the next one, Chris. And the, the first time was from the U.S. to the Med, and the reason being that we were in the U.S. area and we needed to get to the Med, so that's the way to go. I'm not really thinking or taking into account too much, and sometimes ignorance is bliss, but not taking into account that the North Atlantic crossing is considered the most difficult, the hardest, and the most complicated to do. So once you start, you might as well start with the hardest and work, work your way down. It's always easier that way. Um, so what we did was we actually sailed from Fort Lauderdale to Cuba, straight into Havana, which um, we'll touch on later. And then afterwards went to the Bahamas. There I found my crew, which I'll talk about how do you find crew later on. But essentially the crew joined me. You can see them on the right there. And we basically headed out from the Bahamas to Bermuda, across to the Azores and into Spain. And it, technically you have the Gulf Stream pushing you along. You have the wind from the Arctic coming down off the, off the, in the globe from the north. You have wind coming from the south. Waves are, are on a beam reach. It's a little bit more complicated technically, but at the end of the day, it was absolutely spectacular being that the longest run we had of straight sailing was 11 days with um, essentially just some trimming here and there of the sails and maybe one or two nights in which we um, had to reef. But all in all, um, it was absolutely awesome. We, we raised the sails in, in Bahamas uh, in the anchorage and dropped them in the channel in Bermuda four days later um, and then raised them in the channel in uh, Bermuda and essentially on the way to the Azores, which was a 14 day sail. We sailed 11 days straight, motored for a little bit, and then sailed straight into, into Fayal Horta, um, which is the island in the Azores where most people touch, um, touch the, the first part of their crossing at the end of the big crossing, what it's called. And the crew were four of us, which made for um, basically an easy crossing, three hours work at night, three hours during the day. You do your turn cooking, you do your turn um, doing your chores, and it's, it's much easier physically than, than expected. Next one, Chris. <clears throat> the second crossing, which is um, what is known as the milk run or the coconut run, or um, as a, friends of mine would say, a well, um, a well provisioned piece of driftwood would, would get there if you let it, which is technically the easiest. You head out of the Med or out of the British Isles, wherever you are in that side of the world, down to the Canary Islands, which are about 800, 900 nautical miles south of the um, opening for Gibraltar off the coast of Africa, they're at Spanish territory, you go to the island of Gran Canaria and um, head out from Las Palmas, basically head south toward Cape Verde and at some point when the butter melts, as the old people used to say, old school people, you just turn right and head towards the Caribbean and pick your island and you're there. You have following seas and following um, wind all the way. I think we had the main up for a total of two hours in that entire crossing of um, 19 days. It's all head sails, it's all um, simple. We caught a lot of fish, we caught seven mai in 24 hours and then stopped fishing because we only fish when we can eat, we don't fish for fun. Um, once the freezer was full, I said to the guys, that's it, we're done. 
And essentially a week later, the woman in the picture asked me for tuna. We dropped the lines back in the water and never caught a thing after that. And I guess that's why it's called fishing and not catching. But um, all in all, was, I had a Dutch crew that was referred to me. And that crazy picture on the left over there is there is something called the Dutch uh, Christmas, which is different from the regular Christmas. And they do a dress up and they have all these songs that they play and they brought all this with them and they decorated the boat in the middle of the Atlantic, played their songs on the sound system. And it was a little surreal, the four of us sitting there celebrating Dutch Christmas. For me, obviously, everything was new. I'd never knew anything about it. And getting dressed up and, and participating in that, that was an awesome day in the middle of the ocean with nobody around but us. So that, that was really cool. And here again, we had a crew of three plus myself. So with four, making it very easy. You can move on to the next one, Chris. Um, the last crossing was maybe the most complicated of all just because of COVID. So in February 2020, this is I call my crazy COVID story. And in February of 2020, I took possession of the Leopard 45, but I decided um, instead of picking up here in Fort Lauderdale, I would head out to South Africa where it's made and get to tour the factory, pick the boat up in South Africa, and then go to Namibia, St. Helena, Brazil, and enjoy some of the things that are along the way and, and you know, head towards the Caribbean that way. So in the beginning of February 2020, I picked up my um, Leopard 45, very excited and, and happy, and COVID hit over there like it hit everywhere else in the world, and everybody else, um, everybody knows how the last year and three months have been. So I got locked down on the, um, on the dock in Cape Town by myself on the boat. There were three of us there in the leopard dock. There were 21 brand new leopards. There was a leopard skipper that um, was hired to watch all the boats, a British gentleman who um, had come to pick up his boat and myself um, for three months in the one supermarket, essentially. And after three months, thankfully, I managed to get permission to leave. There were bridges along the way, so you couldn't just leave in the middle of the night. I had to um, secure permission from the South African government and I put an ad in Facebook on the um, Seeking a Crew ad, and those two gentlemen that you see there in the middle uh, contacted me. They're connected one to each other. One's a young guy, and the other one's a little bit more experienced. The kid in the middle had never been on a sailboat before, but he was um, just a free diver and a surfer and very uh, acclimated to deep sea fishing and stuff like that. And they hopped on the boat, and we left. And 35 days later, no stops anywhere, and nobody allowed us to even come close to any shore. And 35 days and um, 5,600 nautical miles later, we arrived in St. Vincent in the Caribbean and were quarantined promptly for five more days until they did PCR tests and allowed us to uh, leave. So that was definitely a very unique experience, mainly because the ocean was empty. There were no planes in the sky. There were no sailboats, of course. There were no cruise ships, of course. Even the commercial shipping lanes were almost empty. And essentially, from the moment we left Cape Town until the moment we hit the St. Vincent, we saw one boat 12 miles away from us. So we didn't see an actual living soul from the moment we left until the moment we arrived 35 days later. A little bit strange, but it was an awesome experience all in all. And we sailed most of the way. We were left with um, enough fuel to uh, motor about 100 miles. We went through the doldrums. We went through a couple of um, really quiet days where we motored. But all in all, it was just long, but awesome. And obviously a shakedown cruise for the 45, which we didn't really manage to do many sea trials while we were in, in, in South Africa. And those of you who are wondering, there's enough space on the 45 to provision for six months. So food was not an option, not a problem at all. Chris? Now a couple of questions before we go to talk about crew. Also, I see some folks who are raising their hand on the participant window. There's a Q&A button, drop your question in there and we'll be sure to get them answered. So the first question comes from Randy in terms of the sail configuration of the 40 and the 45. Tell us a little bit in terms of bow sprit, yes or no, and then what downwind sails or light wind sails did you have in addition to the Genoa and the main? So um, you can see the evolution of myself as a cruiser and a sailor as time goes by. On the 40, I had the main, the Genoa, and a what is known as a Jenniker, which is sort of a balloon sail that comes over the front. It's a combination between a spinnaker and a Genoa and no bowsprit and really not much knowledge how to handle it. The Jenniker is also very delicate, over 12 knots um, apparent. 
it's already at its limit. So essentially, not really much in the way of head sales. And in fact, the um, so the North Atlantic crossing was very easy. It was all a beam reach, and was main was up, and and for 99% of the time, and that was it. On the crossing back from um, from the Caribbean, we did something called a barber hauler, which is basically you open up the Genoa to the cleat, uh, the midship cleat, and sort of give it more in face time towards the wind coming from behind. It's a slow process and it's a slow solution, but it's a solution based on what we had at the time. And that was what we did most of the time. Obviously with the 45, I grew up, I have a bowsprit, I have a code D, I have a parasailer, which is a totally different animal. And essentially with the code D, which is a, a very large light air sail that sits on a bowsprit forward from the, the bow and envelopes the boat almost to behind the shrouds and works from about 40 degrees to about 170, I'd say. A huge sail, light air, works up until 15, 16, that's true. And then a parasailer, which is a huge balloon sail that um, envelopes the entire front of the boat with a wing on it. So which acts as a sort of reef, you can keep it up and it basically covers the front. You can also, with a little bit of maneuvering and as you get to learn to work it better, you can also run it on a beam reach. Um, that you can leave up until they say 25 true. I will say not, not on purpose, but we got caught with it out at 36 true. And then we managed to drop it. We had one real storm on the third crossing, which was 20 hours and it was 30 blowing to 40. And that's where we got caught with the parasailer up, but we managed to drop it pretty quickly with um, certain techniques that we'd learned over the time because my training on the parasailer basically was canceled due to COVID as well. So we sort of learned on the fly as we did it. And once we dropped it, we opened the Genoa with the barber holder and we were sailing with that at 40 knots with no problems at all. Any other questions, Chris? Average. Yeah, you bet. A couple more here. What was your average boat speed on each of those crossings? For the uh, North Atlantic crossing, the average was about between six and seven. The Mid-Atlantic, which was the slowest also because we had the weakest um, sail configuration, it was approximately five. And with the South Atlantic crossing with the Cape Town, um, it was between seven and eight, but that's a little bit complicated to say because you got to divide that crossing into two. There's from Cape Town up until the corner of Natal in Brazil, which is probably, um, I would say it's closer to seven, between seven and eight. And then there is a awesome current that runs from that corner all the way to the Caribbean for 2,000 miles, which runs from two to four knots. And um, essentially, I have the software, and we'll talk about that about weather later. I basically hopped on that current, and we had a minimum of two knots all the time. So you're starting the day with a 48 a nautical miles in the bank before you've even started. So there, our average speed popped up to about eight, nine um, on average. Top speed on both boats sliding down a wave. One was 18.3 and the other was 18.5. But the, the 45 was very comfortable in the 10 to 11 range when the winds were according, when we were reefed and the wind and stuff like that. When the winds were, were good for that, you didn't feel any problem with the 11 and 12. There was during that big storm that I was talking about, the 40 knot storm, we were starting to hit 14 and 15 and slide too fast down the waves. And all I did was took three um, dock lines tied a couple of knots at the end of them, put, tied them on a cleat and dropped them behind the, the boat, what is called a warp. And that immediately slowed us down by two or three knots and made the ride much smoother. We ran with that about 12 hours and then I pulled them in and, and that was fine. So it's a, in average, it's the, the, the 45 being at a longer hull um, was about two knots, two and a half knots faster on average. Any other questions, Chris? Yeah, two more and then we'll carry on to crew here. Just one practical question on insurance when it comes to crossing oceans. Uh, Anders says that their investigation really only kind of credits or, or kind of determines coverage based on experience in that boat. Very little credit for experience on other boats. Any, any issues or, or guidance that you could give on the insurance piece when it comes to crossing? Insurance is a... a hot wire button, which I'm not going to touch, but in general, um, it's changed a lot over the last four years because of all the hurricanes. I had, um, it was much easier securing the insurance when I crossed the first time, 
compared to the last time, the, the restrictions and the terms and conditions and the exclusions have gone up drastically. The list of um, compliance issues that you have to have has also gone up drastically, and there are many companies out there. Some of them don't insure crossings at all. It's it's a individual. It's an individual issue, but it is a complicated issue for the community, and it's one that's getting worse. Next question. I'll, I'll I'll stop there for the questions, and I'll let you pop into crew, and we can follow back with some more. Okay, so crew crew is an issue. Crew is important because you've got to live with these people, and once you leave, there's no turning back, and there's no getting off. And on the other hand, you need crew to to get from side to side, and and for me. I don't care if you don't know how to sail because you're not making any changes without me anyway. And when you're going one way to a direction on the other side of the ocean, a couple of degrees this way or that way are not important. And you're not packing, you're not dropping the sails, you're not doing all sorts of things that you do when you go for a day sail or, or a, just a quick island hop. So um, the more important part of the crew is the social aspect, the responsibility, the uh, compliance issue, I find boat owners um, are a little bit more difficult to deal with because they forget that they're not the boat owner at, the, at some point and you have to sort of remind them. Um, the most important thing is people that are responsible, that they'll get up for their watches on time, that they'll work well um, socially with everybody else who's on the boat because uh, the vast majority of the time you're, you're not physically doing a um, manual labor. You're hanging out, you're cooking, you're cleaning, there's chores, there's maintenance, there's all sorts of things and everybody's got to get along in a very small space and if you don't know each other then that only adds to that. So essentially those are the things I look for in crew. In, in two instances the crew was referred to me. I, the first instance it's actually the crew that I, I knew them, I'd met them, they'd owned their own Leopard 40 actually, that's the middle picture in the top. The couple on the right were sailing on a, an older Leopard 40. I met them a couple of times in the Bahamas and in, in Florida. And we became friendly and we chatted about crossings and I basically said to them, come and cross with me. And they said yes. And the gentleman on the left was a friend of theirs who sails a monohull um, throughout the, the West Coast. And actually that's a, a quick, quick funny story. He, on the first day when we left the Bahamas, after about eight, nine hours, he comes running to my cabin. Jonathan, said, Jonathan, come quickly, there's something wrong. And I was like, jump up, it's my first crossing, my first day, and now I'm a little bit nervous, what the hell's going on? And he takes me to the back of the cockpit and he says, there's some strange noise here. And, and basically, um, says, wait, wait, wait. And then we hear a bang from the bottom on the bridge deck. And I started laughing and he said, that, that, and I started laughing and he couldn't understand why I was laughing. So the endless uh, comments we as uh, catamaran people always get from the monohull people is the slap, slap, slap of the bridge deck. And that's exactly what it was, but him being a monohull sailor had no idea what it was and he was all worried that something's going wrong. And after we laughed, everybody calmed down and that was the end of that. But excellent crew member. The other, the other people, the Dutch people were referred to me by friends of ours that I met actually sailing in Greece and they had met them sailing in, in Italy. And when I said, I'm looking for a crew, he said, oh, I know these people, they live on a monohull. They um, have been sailing in the Med for a couple of years and are interested in doing a crossing. So here's their phone number, let me connect between you. And basically that's how I found them. And as I said, the Cape Town ones, it was a result of COVID because I had interviewed, I had a whole crew set up. There is a, a sailing school in, in Cape Town where a lot of young uh, men and women who want to get into the sailing industry and anybody who's been around the super yacht world and the mega yacht world know that there's an unwritten rule that no mega yacht can leave the dock with at least, with a minimum of two South Africans, uh, without a minimum of two South Africans on board. And they're everywhere. And I'd had um, I'd posted an, a, a notice at the school and I'd had interviews and I basically locked down a crew before the whole COVID thing started. And obviously that all disappeared. And these guys I found from um, looking for a crew on Facebook. There's a group, Facebook group, which I've used a, a few times since then as well. And it works very well. You got to inter interview people. They interview you essentially. You got to feel comfortable with each other. And, um, and it's a gamble, not always an easy one. Next. Talking about crew here in respect to doing big ocean crossings, when we were talking earlier this week, you had recently hopped from St. Augustine down to Fort Lauderdale. And I think you used a sailing school or you reached out to the sailing school. Share a little bit of, of, about you know, the, that approach to finding crew as well. Yes, that is an excellent approach. If there is a, a yacht club or a sailing school anywhere where you're, you're at, and yes, I came down from St. Augustine um, over the weekend to Fort Lauderdale. 
and I was not sure if one of my sons could join me or not. So I called the, there is a St. Augustine sailing club there. It's a school and a club. It's sort of a combo. And I spoke to the general manager. I said, team, I'm looking for a crew. I've got this and this and this. He posted on their board and that it's 11.45 going down to, to Fort Lauderdale. Two-day crew. It was a 40-hour run. And anybody interested, contact Jonathan directly. I had five text messages and two phone calls within 20 minutes. I did the same. I came up from a St. Croix in February to Fort Lauderdale. I was looking for somebody to come with me. I put an ad in Facebook, and there's a the St. Croix Yacht Club. Within two hours, I found a, a guy who needed a mileage for his certifications. I said to him, it's a seven-day run. If you want to come with me, you know, we leave tomorrow. He was like, sure. And he turned out to be an excellent kid, an excellent crew member. So it's not hard to find. You just got to be a little bit creative. And if you need him, um, there's always somebody who wants to get a bit of mileage uh, and get it out on the ocean. I've had people that even I'm just chatting with here in Fort Lauderdale. Can you take us out for a day sailing and stuff like that? And, and it, it's easy to find. Uh, moving on to sailing the med. So Chris asked me to give a little bit of background sailing the med. So the med is a, a, a fun and an uncomfortable place at the same time. The, the med is basically, as you can see from this slide, a huge lake. You've got the Sahara Desert on the bottom, which is extremely hot and has no real mountains and stuff. And then you've got the Alps on the top, which also have glaciers and stuff like that, which create a totally different atmosphere. And in the middle, you've got this huge lake that's called the Med. And you get three weather systems in a day, and it can go from zero to 30 in two seconds. If you are sailing along the coast in Spain, for example, um, you'll go between the mountains and it'll be zero or five or six knots and then bang, you, you hit, hit the, around the mountain before you hit the next one and it's 25, 30 knots there for another five minutes and then it goes back. So there's a lot of those little challenges and then the waves in the mid are, are very, they're not very big, but there's a very short period so they become very choppy and you can have a wave hitting one hull and um, another wave hitting the other hull all at the same time. So it creates a little bit of a a choppy um, atmosphere is sort of bouncing around a little bit. And, and then nothing is, uh, because of this whole situation of the lake and, and the winds coming off the north, which go through all the mountains and create uh, strong winds, and then hit, there's nowhere for them to bump into, so they spread out when they head south. It's very hard to sustain um, long sails. The most sailing, so we sailed, I sailed all the way to Greece, essentially. I did not do the um, eastern med, but from the um, Gibraltar to, to Greece, the most we sailed was 18 hours, and that was when we left the Aeoli Islands, which is just outside of Naples, and sailed to the Balearics to Parma, and that's a three-day sail. The most we had the sails up were 18 hours, and other than that, the most we had the sails up were four hours at a time. And there we sailed with head sails, we sailed with the, with the main sail, with all the different sails, but very hard to sustain more than four or six hours at a time just because of the way it works. So, you know, it's just something to take into account when going to the mid. <clears throat> Chris? So while, while I was asked to just expand a little bit about the rules for sailing the mid, there's what is called the Schengen rules, which is the Schengen is the town where this was agreed upon. It's nothing special as far as the name goes other than the name of the town. But essentially all the Eastern European countries are members and agreed to these rules. One for the vessel, one for the people. For the vessel, it's 18 months. You're allowed to be consecutive in, in the um, Euro Schengen zone, what they call. And then you have to leave. You can leave for one day and go out and come back. So um, since Brexit, for example, even Gibraltar now is, is, um, is not part of Schengen. But it's easy. From uh, Spain, you can go to um, Tangier in Morocco. From Italy, you can go to uh, Tunisia. From Italy or, or Greece, you can go to... Albania, Montenegro, Croatia, any one of those. You can go for one day and turn around and come back. A lot of people fuel up in, in Tunisia or in, in Montenegro where it's cheap compared to the European uh, fuel prices. So, you know, it's an excuse to go and fuel up. For people, it's a little bit more complicated. It's you're allowed to be 90 days within 180 day period, and then you got to leave. Um, to be fair, we were there for two seasons, almost two years, and we sort of flew back and forth to the US a lot. and um, didn't really have any issues with that. We flew mainly out of Spain, Italy, and, and Greece, less out of the northern countries. So we never really ran into any issues with that. Next. So the, the other thing that is worth mentioning about sailing in the Med is it is spectacular. It's spectacular in 
in what it has to offer as far as sightseeing and culture. The reason we do all this beyond the actual sailing part is to go and experience other cultures, see other countries, learn what the locals do. And when you do it with your own boat, you're on your own time and you're not in a hurry so you can afford to do things a little differently. And the example is there's a town in Spain called Cartagena, which I thought was only in Colombia, but it turns out that there's one in Spain too. And when we were in Cadiz, a guy anchored um, uh, moored next to us in the marina said to me, don't, don't miss out on, on um, Cartagena, you'll really love it. And we, we were approaching, I was like, okay, we'll um, stop there for an overnight provision, fuel up and we'll be gone. We ended up being there 14 days. There was some Roman ruins we found. There was a beautiful town nearby. We rented a car and went to see. Then there was a local festival. Then there was some sort of um, fair there and some summer experience. And we ended up being there 14 days because we don't, we're not in a hurry. We can go and come back whenever we want. And that's, the Med is awesome that way. We parked the boat many times and took cheap flights and flew to Hungary and to Switzerland and to all sorts of other places and spent a weekend or a few days exploring and then coming back to, um, coming back to the boat, which the Med is, is very easy to. We left the boat in Malta, we flew back to the US, then we flew back again, we've spent some time in Italy. It's very easy to do all that and it's very easy and the, the you know, everything in the Europe is very old. Cultures are very different. I mean, from the, the, the western part of Europe is probably, I don't know, close to the size of Texas more or less, but you've got like 15 countries there which you can experience a multitude of different cultures and, 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 and cuisines all within a very close period. We went to the boat show in Cannes in France over there. We parked the boat and, and you know, hopped over to Cannes. There, there are lots of things to do. It's very easy. And everybody always asks about the med mooring. So med mooring is basically one of the easiest things to do. And it's all it is, is you need to know how to back up your boat to a wall. That's essentially how to do med mooring. It's a very intelligent way of um, mooring because you get a lot more boats in a lot um, less space. You don't have the finger piers between each boat. I know here in the US it's sort of frowned upon, but after the first, second time that you do it, it's an easy, simple thing to do. Next. Move on to, to planning. Just a question here around single handing the boat. I know that you have a lot of experience doing this. So the first part of the question is on the 40 and 45, good boats to single hand on? Yeah, they're, they're, I have a, a section at the end where I will touch on that for a minute, but Essentially, the lines all run back to the helm. It's very easy. Once you understand and get comfortable with the boat, it's pretty much the same. You just have to understand that the loads on the 45 are a little bit bigger than the loads on the, um, on the 40. Let's, uh, let's talk about planning and go to the next slide, and then it'll make it, make it a little bit easier to, to explain. So planning is, is um, we, we sail with something that I call, which I learned from a very astute um, leopard delivery skipper, who taught me, um, we do things with the pet method. And I said, what's the pet method? I'm your pet, or how does that work? So after the laughter died down, he said, no, we plan, we execute, and then we tidy up. And if you think about it, everything you do on the boat matches that. You plan, you execute, and you tidy up. So planning is, is essential to a successful sale. And what I've done is, what I do is I, I divide up the sailing and the planning that I do into these four groups, coastal cruising, island hopping, overnight sailing, long distance passage making, and the planning for each one is different. So coastal cruising will also include a day sail. If you have friends that show up at your marina and say, you say, let's go out for a few hours and come back. It's, it's essentially coastal cruising, only shorter than a, than a full day or whatever. So in, if you look on the bottom of the, 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 the slide, I sort of divided up the different areas in which we plan. From safety equipment to weather routing, I mean, I'm not gonna read it, everybody can read for themselves, but essentially you've got to take each one of these um, buckets and match whatever it is that you need to whatever it is that you're doing. So obviously the long distance passage making is the most complicated and encompasses all the others. And you, the, the coastal cruising of safety equipment and food and entertainment recreation, you don't need more than a couple of sandwiches for the day and you're done. Long distance passage making 35 days, you need food for 60 because you never know what's going to happen. Now, dry goods is very easy. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the long distance passage making and that uh, will apply to everything else only with lesser importance. So everybody always asks me, do you have enough food? How did you have enough food? So first of all, these boats are big and you can load a lot of stuff on them and you can put food for six months easily on these boats. But it's
Uh, looks like you got muted on your end. Sorry. Oh, I apologize. I don't go. know where I lost you, but um, essentially, people, you know, I talk about um, food and how important it is because, you know, everybody has to be comfortable and happy with the food. Otherwise, they can't um, function properly. So we talk about three weeks. The first week, you look at uh, perishable stuff. That's lettuce, that's fresh vegetables, that's fresh, uh, um, fresh uh, fruit and things like that, like bananas will only last a few days, things like that. So the first week, you eat all that fresh stuff that you can. The second week, you look at frozen stuff, frozen meat. You look at stuff that uh, lasts longer, cabbage, uh, onions, um, apples, oranges, Things that will they'll sustain themselves, squash, potatoes, those, those will last more than a week, more than 10 days, more than two weeks sometimes. So that's what you look at the second, the second week. And then in the third week, you go into frozen stuff, cans, and throughout it all, you have dry goods. Dry goods being uh, rice, pasta, uh, lentils, uh, polenta, beans, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then you, we also fish. We, we drag lines be, between, behind us. And... As I said before, it's fishing, not catching. So we fish a lot, we catch a lot less. But that every time you catch, it's an excitement on the boat, first of all, and everybody gets excited. You hear the scream of somebody saying, fish on, and everybody stops what they're doing and jumps up and down and runs to see how you can help. And then you see what you haul up if the sharks don't get it, which they do many times. Um, and that immediately becomes a fresh meal for that day. I mean, normally, if we catch a fish within an hour, we're eating something of it. Um, and that helps sustain and supplement our food. In fact, with the uh, Cape Town crossing, we ended up with a lot of meat left over. We caught a, a handy amount of fish all the way up to the Amazon River. And after that, there's a lot of seagrass on the water in the Caribbean. And we just pulled in the lines and didn't even fish after that because it was just too much grass and it was entangling in the lines. But up until then, we caught a huge amount of fish. So essentially, when we arrived in St. Vincent, we had quite a lot of uh, meat left over in the freezer because we never really touched it once we had the fresh fish. So that's that's more or less how you look at it. You've also got to look at snacks. You've got to look at the uh, fun stuff. So I had the young kid with me on the Cape Town crossing. At some point, we sort of hid the snacks from him because he was like a, a termite at night during his night watches. We would just find the wrappers everywhere. So we started rationing him so that we'll have something when we're at the end of the thing. But when we got there, we still had a lot of food. We could have gone another 10, 20 days with no problem. And that's, that's essential. And, you know, weather routing is an essential tool, which I'll talk about in a little bit. A safety equipment essential. You know, all those things, sails and, and tools and things to, to um, make sure that you can fix. And I'll, I'll finish this off just with one thing. Somebody asked me when I was doing one of the crossings, so what are you afraid of the most? And my answer was um, not having the right tool or the right equipment to fix something that breaks. Because when you're a thousand miles from anywhere, it's only you, yourself, and I. All three of us have to fix whatever it is that you fix. And if you're lucky and you have a crew member that's creative, then you get a crew member to help you. But at the end of the day, whatever you have on the boat, you need to find and make it work. Sort of like Apollo 11 without the no, no air type of issue. Um, and that's, that's basically what you try and overcome as you're sailing. And that's also the challenge and why, why we do it. Next. So weather, weather is, is crucial. Obviously, we, we try to avoid storms and sail in weather that's comfortable for us. And when we're uh, close to shore and I have uh, access to, to internet and all that, windy is a, it's a good general weather. But I try to always get weather from two or three sources and then um, compare them and get something more accurate. I do use a, a service called Oceans. That's O-C-E-N-S dot com. They actually um, are a weather routing system and they have a, an app. I have a Iridium Sidekick, which is essentially the same as to go, only a handset instead of a box. And it has its own uh, little modem, which I download whether on the left you can see a, a typical screen. This is actually from our crossing from Cape Town. The dots on the left in the, in the sort of half circle, those are Caribbean islands. And the line at the bottom is the, in the Central America. And it'll give you waves, wind, precipitation, and you can also move the cursor around and see over time how things will change when you get to where you are, which is, I find, crucial. The slide in the middle is actually current, surface current. So you can, this is actually from my trip down from St. Augustine last week. The little dot, the blue dot in the top left-hand corner is where we were in St. Augustine, that bump 
in the shoreline is the um, the uh, launching pads in the, um, I'm having a mental block, but where they launch the the, the rockets, and then down towards a uh, down towards Port Lauderdale, you can see that it's the Gulf Stream in the middle of the brown is four or five knots, and the blue is less than a knot. So obviously coming downwards, um, and obviously that's Cape Canaveral, what I blanked on for a second before. Um, so obviously coming down, we hug the coast in order to not run into the stream. So that's important information to have. In addition to that, I have a Garmin inReach, which is, has a texting function that allows you unlimited texts a month. And you can text back and forth. I think that kid who crossed with us from Cape Town in 35 days probably sent like 900 texts to his girlfriend, how much he misses her and all, so on and so forth. But it, it, it's an excellent way to stay in touch. That thing also will give you, when you text, it'll give you a link to a URL that'll open up a map showing where exactly you are on the globe. And it will also, uh, you can set it, I set it to update every six hours. So if somebody's tracking you, where you're going, they can see every six hours and updated the, where your position is. So it just, you know, makes the folks at home a little bit more relaxed. Chris? Sailing solo, which is what people asked before. So I have done solo. I brought my boat up from um, from Grenada to, uh, to, here, to Florida, and I've done a lot of the solo part of it. Longest time I've done solo was 55 hours, 350 miles from Grenada to um, St. Croix, two days, two nights, uh, two and a half days, two nights. It's not easy. It's something that um, I would recommend getting very comfortable sailing with a crew before you even start doing sailing solo, because it's a, you have to fix and solve problems yourself. And sometimes the extra hand makes a substantial difference in what you can and cannot do. The rule of thumb is to do everything earlier, easier, and faster. So if, you re if you're going to reef when you have a crew on board, you need to reef an hour earlier if you're sailing solo. I also, of course, wear my life jacket 100% of the time. And if I'm sailing solo with an overnight and I'm out in the ocean, not uh, along the coast or something, then what I also do is I'll make the saloon into a bed and I won't go down underneath the, um, to, the, to the cabins at all. And I'll um, catnap during the day. If I'm out in the open water, five, six hundred miles from anywhere, you can, with the radar and everything else, you can take an hour and sleep. You're only doing seven, seven or eight knots. Radar works 24 miles. You can do seven miles without uh, expecting to run into anything along the coast. And when I did it from Grenada to to Saint Croix, I didn't sleep more than 20 minutes at a time because there's way too much traffic, there's way too much stuff, and you're way too close to land to not pay attention. I put two or three alarms on um, at all times because, you know, everybody sleeps in different uh, patterns and if you wake up quick or not, but over time you get overtired and you start making mistakes and do stupid things. So if you have to sail solo, um, it's very important to measure it right, do it right, think clearly and do things early more than anything else. The boats themselves are very easy to hand handle solo. It's only when you have a problem that it's hard to solve. Next. Favorite destination. So I was pushed to um, make a commitment on a favorite destination. And the answer is all of them. Because everywhere you go is special. And everything you do is unique. And every time you come up someplace, it's in a way that you didn't expect at all. And in the end, I, I chose two. So the first one in the middle, the picture in the middle is actually a picture of Ken, a crew member from the North Atlantic Crossing. And that is the dock in um, Fayal Horta, where most people that do the North Atlantic Crossing arrive for the first touch of the east, uh, eastern part of the, the Atlantic. And it is very unique in the fact that people are encouraged to paint those squares. So you choose a square and they get painted over as time goes by and people write their names and the date and the names of their crew and sometimes the flag of their nation or if they're very creative, a picture of their boat and everybody paints their arrival there. And it'll stay there until the weather erases it and somebody else will come and paint over it. But it creates a very colorful and unique dock, which was amazing. And just the fact that it's, it was, for me, my first crossing and the fact that I just crossed the almost 2,000 miles of open ocean by myself, a year and a half into sailing, and arriving there was a was a tremendous high. One of the challenges that you do in in order to you know if, if you're into that type of thing, and that was that was very unique. And 
the other thing that all the other pictures that you have around there, it's my daughter and myself. We sailed from a, Fort Lauderdale into Cuba, straight into the Hemingway Marina. This was in 2000, the beginning of 18, with the 40. And you can see a car from the 50s there in the 40 in the background at the Hemingway Marina on the left-hand side. It was just special being the fact that the whole history and the political situation and everything that goes with it, we sailed into Hemingway Marina with no advance notice. They were very, very accommodating, very nice. We spent three weeks in Cuba, in the marina, and touring all over Cuba with a private guy taking a car and sleeping in people's homes. It was a spectacular vacation, a spectacular uh, visit to something that maybe not everybody will get to see, definitely not the way it is now. It's a living car museum with cars from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, everything in Russian cars from the Cold War that we never saw in the West, all sorts of amazing things. We had a phenomenal time there and it was just very, very unique. Chris? So uh, I was asked at the end of my presentation, which that's more or more or less my story, um, to give one piece of advice and, and this is it. One size does not fit all. Um, people ask me many times on a dock, like, how should I configure this? How should I configure that? And I don't proclaim to be the expert in anything. But I always ask, what is it that you want to do? You, there are people that only stay in marinas. I actually met somebody in St. Augustine, who was, we were chatting, and, and he said, yeah, I only go to marinas. I never anchor. I, never. I said, all you need is a very big air conditioner and a very long shore cable, and maybe one to back it up. And that's it. You don't need solar. You don't need a water maker. You don't need all the other things that you need. You first have to decide what you're going to do and how you're going to sail and what you're going to use your boat for, and then match that to that. So um, it's not like I have to buy all these accruements. I have to upgrade all of this stuff. Not everything is important to everybody. I put in a generator on the 45, a nine kilowatt generator in one year and three months, we've got 28 hours on it. Definitely don't need to lug all that weight around, but it's there. So it, in hindsight, should I have bought it? Probably not. So that's my advice is decide what you want to do, decide what kind of sailor you want to be or what kind of cruiser you want to be and then match the boat to that. Not everybody needs everything. So as we move into the Q&A, and Chris, you can give me all the questions, and I just want to say thank you for the attention, and thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting, and Chris, go ahead. OK. Uh, a, a bit all over the place, so I'll try to put them in themes. But when we were talking about the sail plan earlier, talked about using the parasailer. Was the main up or down for the parasailer? Down, down, down. It will shield the parasailer and it will steal the water, the wind away from it. The parasailer is a spectacular sail and it um, in seven knots you can do seven and in nine you can do nine. Talking about speed over ground, not speed through water. It will start to taper off at about nine, ten, but essentially um, you're not going to get the, the angle is not right for the main when you're using the parasailer. And even if you do use it on a beam reach, it's too big. It envelopes the main. And if you pull up the main, you'll shield the parasailer and it'll just flap. So down. Great. And would you ever consider doing an arc circumnavigation? A circumnavigation with arc, I would not want to do only for the reason I want to stop along the way and see stuff. I don't want to do it in a year and a half. The answer is, if the goal is just to do a circumnavigation, yes. But I want to wrap it up into, um, as I explained in the med, park the boat and go to Hungary for a week, and park the boat and go to the Amsterdam for four days. That The ARC doesn't support that because they have a timetable. So it depends what the goal is. Personally, I'd rather do it uh, slower and not in such a hurry. Good advice. If uh, Chris wants to know, hypothetical here if you could do it all over again what would you do differently or would you do things exactly the same in terms of the 40 and then the 45 i would do it the same the um, extra size of the 45 the extra height of this the, the difference in the mast is eight feet that means eight feet more of sail spread out that means the load and the functions and all that the 40 was an awesome boat to make mistakes with, an awesome boat, and much more forgiving for those that don't know. And the advantage of sw switching out the boat in the middle, obviously we're not talking financially, but 
when I came to the 45, I had the knowledge that I did not have on the 40, and I relied on advice from people who gave me excellent advice and did the right thing, but not all advice is suitable to all people. And what I want to do is not necessarily what somebody else wants to do. So when we came to the 45, I designed the boat. The 45 that we have right now can go for six to eight months off the grid, 100%, without needing to interact with a land, with fuel, or with anything else. The 40 could not do that. Those were things that I learned over time. And because I, my desire and my, my goal is to get to the South Pacific and so on, um, I designed the 45 differently, but I did not have that knowledge when I bought the 40. So no, I would not do it differently. David wants to know what, if, if someone listening to this and watching this webinar is thinking about buying a boat and, and being part of cr cruising, what, what advice would you give to someone who's maybe on the fence about it or just starting this journey? So when, when I am... Um, I'm always careful about giving advice because people give you advice and then they go home and you're left with the shitty advice and the and the situation. So I prefer to just say what I think and what I was told and what I do, and that way it makes it much easier. So when I when I when I decided to do this, people said to me, go and charter and go and do, and then you know, see if you really like it, and then don't just buy a boat and go. And I said, no, if I don't buy a boat and go, I'm never going to go. Because when you charter, you have got one week a year or maybe even two weeks a year. And then you get there and you spend the day going over the boat and learning what's going on. And then for two days, you sort of trying to fumble your way around and you finally figure it out on day three. And that's when you have to turn back because it's only a week. And after three days, you've got to turn back so that two days later, you can be back at the dock where you started and give back the boat. I said, that's not going to work. If we go, we got to go all the way. It's either we're in or we're out. And you buy a boat, you can always sell a boat. Thankfully, the market is, is excellent. And spend, it took an easy three months to get comfortable on the boat with how to do stuff, living on a boat, understanding the limitations of fresh water and, and propane and fuel and sun and how to anchor and anchors dragging and how to drop the anchor and not drag and how to swim on the anchor and how to raise the sails and how to reef. It was an easy three to five months of um, full time to get to the point where you can have an informed decision of, I really want to do this or I don't. So there are a lot of couples that start and 90 days later, they hand back the boat and say, sell it, which is, that's, that's okay. At least they tried and I respect them for that. I just think that with chartering about twice a year or three times a year, you don't get the real experience. Next. Uh, this one here talks about the, the, the question is about the commissioning process for the 45. So I know that COVID might have thrown a wrench in, in some of that, but can you talk about what it was like to take the delivery commissioning, shakedown crews and getting those issues resolved in South Africa? Uh, yes, the COVID absolutely tore that apart. We had a, a whole plan. You have 90 days in South Africa from the day the, the, bo the boat hits the water, not the day that you take possession of the boat. Our boat hit the water on 19 January. We took possession on February 6. They start counting from 19 January. You've got 90 days, otherwise they hit you with VAT, which is 15%. So we made a list of all the, the upgrades that we wanted to do, and, and not all of them were available in South Africa, and that's why... I'm here in Fort Lauderdale now, absolutely taking care of the rest. And some of the stuff uh, got delayed because of um, COVID, once the lockdown came, and we left with the doing only two sea trials of an hour, which don't really constitute sea trials, and um, didn't finish the commissioning because we had no option. And I finished a lot of it in Grenada, and I'm doing the rest of it now, a year and three months later. Unfortunately, that's just the way things happened. and. The, basically, the real shakedown cruise was from Cape Town. What we did was we went to their Home Depot, which is in, called Builder's Warehouse, but the same thing. I bought whatever tools I could find. There was one uh, chandlery open. I bought some spares, whatever I could find also, and we left. And there were um, simple things, you know, nothing really major that went wrong, but there were simple things that uh, were not set up right as we um, crossed, and we fixed them along the way. So by the time we got to um, St. Vincent, 5,600 nautical miles later, there was no commissioning left to be done. But it it's definitely was a complicated three-step process because of COVID. I can, um, offline, I can give you advice on, you know, how to do it in Cape Town if somebody's interested. In, after spending four plus months there, um, you know, 
I, I got to know everybody, but ours was not the standard. Next. Excellent. And uh, just one more quick question here. There are a couple of unanswered questions in the chat. Katie's email is on the screen, so sh shoot her a note if we didn't get a chance to get your question. Um, last one here, pr pretty uh, tactical one. When you're with your dinghy and you're sailing, is it on the davits or are you towing, towing it behind? It's always on the davits with the engine on the dinghy. I have a, a system that I developed over the three crossings with the ratchet straps, how I secure it. And it's rock solid. It doesn't move. I actually um, I make sure to take the plug out. We, in one of the crossings, in one of the storms, we um, had waves breaking over the, uh, over the coach roof. And the water was draining through the dinghy, actually, out. So, um, and the boat was, was solid. I, I have to say, as a side note, everybody asks about the door and all that. We went through the three crossings. We had waves breaking over the boom at some point and all that. Never once did I feel in any situation that I'm worried or anything like that. And not one drop came in from the doors ever. Um, in fact, there's from the first crossing, the North Atlantic crossing, and somewhere in the archives of Leopard, there's a video clip of um, a wave filling up the, the front and draining. And within seconds, and I was actually standing by the, by the chart table in the front, and one of the crew members was filming it. And I turned around and said, did you get that? And it was afterwards published. So. It's rock solid. It's not a problem, and I I do. And I can send Katie pictures later, or if you want, of how I set it up. But with ratchet straps and with the with it tied in, it's always on the data. Awesome, Jonathan. I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience and lending your time today, uh, and thank everyone for spending part of their day with us. Please take a moment to give us your feedback on the next screen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.